say that failure has no value. It's a complete downer. And if it happens to you once, it'll probably happen again. Strange distinction, huh? I think what is obvious to anyone who's probed the subject very much is people who are extremely successful didn't get there because they never made a mistake. They got there because they weren't going to allow their mistake to make them a mistake. We're afraid that if we fail once, we're going to fail again. Oh, I'm going to dismiss the Sunday school. Sorry about that. I'm not a failure. I'm just anxious to get into the word of the Lord and share with what God has given me because I feel like God has something for everybody that's here today. So we're afraid. We fail once. We think we're going to fail again. And in the very same way. So then we just learn to quit trying. I'm so glad we didn't use that tactic when we were kids. I come from the day when kindergarten wasn't compulsory. Now preschool is compulsory. They better know kindergarten stuff when they get to kindergarten. Or they're going to keep them back. So mama thought that us boys just needed to be boys till kindergarten. Problem with that is I couldn't write my name and I couldn't tie my own shoe. And it was a rude awakening when I showed up at school and my shoelaces were undone and I was embarrassed because I didn't know how to tie the bow on the shoe. Never one time, though, did it enter into my mind that I might as well give up and start wearing slip-ons. My Lord, I just got out of them. My mama made me wear those criss crisscross sandals, open-toe sandals for so long, I wanted to burn them in a fire. I said, Mom, I can't wear those wimpy things to school now. I'm growing up. I got to have me some rubber front sneakers. Yeah, but you're going to have to tie them, son. I went home that day, that day, and I learned how to tie my shoe. See, that's the way children, you ever watch a child play with blocks? They try to build up a building and it falls down and they go right back to it. Or they try to put a square peg in a round hole and it doesn't fit. They'll work on it, work on it. Then they'll drop that and pick something else up. It might be a triangle. But eventually they land on the right fit. And little by little, they begin to piece together their skills. Children don't, don't go halfway through learning something and then decide, well, this just isn't me. I'll just move on to something else. No, they keep on keeping on and keeping on if they have to start over from scratch again and again and again. <laughs> Successful people don't fear failure, they embrace it. And victorious saints of God don't fear failure, they embrace it. The people that are in this church that are exemplary Christians aren't exemplary Christians because they have a perfect track record. They're exemplary Christians because they would not concede to the failures that they've met along the way and they learned how to bounce back with a vengeance. I read this morning in uh, the Daily Mail, and these are the quotes of the headlines. My scars don't define me. These were the words of Elizabeth Gilrath, who had one of these little cheesy carnivals that we go to sometime. Got her hair stuck in one of the mechanical arms and was completely scalped. The scars went across the top of her eyebrow, where it looked like it took the whole scalp off of her head. 
And now after having gone through several surgeries and having big uh, suture marks all across her forehead to where her eyes are kind of uh, slightly pinned back in a way that you can tell it's not natural. And half of her hair is pure skin. She has no, no hair growing there at all. She said, my scars don't define me and nobody's scars should define them. He thought you were worth saving. He believed in you when you didn't believe in you. When you thought your life was so scattered and so broken and so worthless and so unredeemable. When you really believed what Brother Delgado said, you were only worth a few bucks. God said, uh, you're worth the universe and all that's in it to me. And I want to preach to somebody who's carrying scars with you that you think forbid you from uh, the purpose and from the unfolding of God's plan. Don't let your scars define you. If you do let your scars define you, do it the way Paul did it. I bear in my body the marks of the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, if I am deformed, if I walk with a lean over, if you see me hobble, it's only because I've endured the shipwreck and the stoning and the lashings, uh, amen, and the imprisonments uh, and the bonds. Uh, but I, outside of that, uh, all is well within my my soul. These are marks of triumph uh, over the hostilities of life uh, and over the prowess of hell. And I have my praise today. Praise God. Come on, lift those arthrit arthritic hands in the air if that's what you got. And say, I bear in my body the marks of the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, hallelujah. Lift that voice. It might be weak uh, and frail, but if you're saying Jesus, uh, you're joining the mighty chorus of the ages and so Job 42 and 10 and the Lord turned the captivity of Job when he prayed for his friends also the Lord gave Job twice as much as he had before and the Lord turned the captivity. I want to preach about the turning point. Some of you think God needs to warm up in order to work a miracle in your circumstances. I'm telling you we serve an instantaneous God. And the depression that you've carried for so many years that bondage can be turned in this service today. And you can leave here leaping for joy, celebrating the victory, and praising God for a bright future. And so when we think of the life of Job, it's important to understand that the dealings that God had with Job are instructions for you and I as to how God processes our hardships. If the story of Job bore no meaning or provided us no revelation as to how God's ways operate, then there would be no sense hardly in reading the story. So what the story of Job and other stories where God works through the ramifications of people's life is it tells us that God has a pattern. That God's ways are sometimes not like our ways. But ultimately, he gets people to the destination. Sometimes in a roundabout way. But <laughs> when we don't know what to do, you can rest assured there is a God in heaven who knows what he's doing. And he is able. Praise God. Does anybody believe that God is able this morning? So you know, I don't have Job's life. And you don't have Job's life. But we have Job's 
God. Hallelujah. And the God that can turn the captivity of Job is the God that can bring a turning point in your life. The God that brought him out of such misery and loss and personal despair is the same God who can bring you out of financial bondage. He can bring you out of spiritual decay. He can bring you out of loneliness and nights of weeping tears on your pillow. This God that I serve, amen, is a change agent. This God that I serve never leaves you the same. When he shows up, we're all kind of different ways. But when he finishes up, amen, there's something common in our experience. And that is God. God has turned our captivity and we're free. Does anybody want to be free today? <laughs> Hallelujah. Amen. That liberty bringer is in this house. And so it does this expression turned the captivity is interesting. It doesn't say that God turned Job's poverty even though he ended up with twice as much as he had before. It doesn't say that he turned his sickness, even though presumably he's no longer filled with boils and sores from head to toe. It doesn't say he turned his sorrow, although I'm sure that when God delivered him from what he was bound by, tears and sorrows fled. But there's something more that's meant here by this word captivity. You see, you can be poor, but not a captive. Matter of fact, there's some people that live paycheck to paycheck that literally have a better life than corporate CEOs who spend every waking hour worrying over the fortunes of a company or over whether they're going to make the, meet the butler payroll and this payroll and that payroll and the beach house and all the things that they can become encumbered with. So you cannot say that having a lot of stuff necessarily increases the level of your contentment or happiness. If it did, then it would be proven in the suicide rates. But most of the suicides happen to people that have already attained a lot of the, these world's goods. But what they have discovered is these world's goods do not replace the hollow that is in the soul. So, so, so a poor person can uh, be poor, but not in captivity. A person can be very sick and not be in captivity. Haven't we t heard about the Apostle Paul praying, Lord, take this affliction away from me. We don't know what it was, but the presumption is it's probably something to do with a physical ailment. Some say he was going blind. Some say he had uh, scoliosis so bad that he was a hunchback. Could have been a lot of things. But he asked God to relieve him of those painful limitations. And God said, my grace is sufficient for thee. Then what did Paul respond? Most gladly, therefore, will I glory in my infirmities. Hallelujah. Anyhow, praise God. If God said he's got as much grace as my sick bodily frame needs, then I'm going to rejoice in my infirmities. Because when I am weak, then I am strong. <laughs> Woo. It's called The Last Lecture. Dr. Randy Posh was, was given the award, I think, in 2007 as one of the 100 most influential people in the world. So influential, when he went on the Oprah Winfrey show, she gave him 10 minutes of uninterrupted time to make a speech. More than 10 million people have seen his video called The Last Lecture. You see, Dr. Posh was a 40-some-year-old college professor and then was given the grim diagnosis of pancreatic cancer. And after the first regimen of treatment, when the pancreatic cancer returned, it was a death sentence. The physicians attending to him gave him six months to live. 
And so he resigned from his duties at the university and he made a speech for his two and four and six year old children. So that someday when he's dead and gone, he could compress into 70 minutes everything that he wanted to tell them in the course of their lifetimes. And it became a hit, the last lecture. Suddenly, everybody wanted to hear his story. His story wasn't written to help everybody in general. It was written to help his own. It was a goodbye, farewell. This is your father. This is how he felt. This is what he wants for you kind of a lecture. But it resonated with people. And it gave them a breath of inspiration. And they called for him. And he said these words about his own lecture. He said it boggled my mind. I give lectures. Lecturing was all I ever did. But this one uh, went viral. He said if I would have given this same lecture and weren't dying. It wouldn't have had the resonance or the gravitas. He said context is everything in other words there's something about the prescription for life from a man whose life has been cut short by a bitter d disease that healthy people can get strength from context is everything and so we can't understand why we're not in high cotton all the time and we can't understand why sometimes uh, we have um, uh, ailments, uh, amen, that, that stay with us and have limitations that become obvious to others around us. And sometimes we think God is making a spectacle out of us. Amen. When we have to go through troublesome circumstances, maybe a family member, maybe a work situation, maybe a bankruptcy, maybe something that's embarrassing or discomforting. And you wonder, God, how can this be of any good? Context is everything. People are watching you. And when they see you navigate your way through the storm and do so with grace and with confidence and with faith in God. Amen. Context is everything. Then when you open your mouth and say God is good all the time. Somebody says, did you hear what they said? Did you hear what they said? Praise God. Amen. Most gladly therefore will I rejoice in my infirmity that the power of Christ may rest upon me. So if you spend your thoughts on all the reasons why you can't, then you won't. If you spend your thoughts wishing you had what others have, prepare to be a wisher for the rest of your life. If you spend your mental energies making excuses or blaming situations or other people for what you don't have, enjoy being a victim because you're going to be in the prison of victimhood for a long, long time. If you love feeling guilty about things you can't control, amen, or situations uh, come into you about the time you start to enjoy your life a little bit here comes that delirious shadow of guilt and shame to uproot your happiness and spoil your fun good luck with that but if you are sick and tired of making excuses if you are sick and tired of giving yourself reasons why you can't and you're ready to step up and say with God's help I can't then there is a turning point available to you in this service this morning. If you need a change, and you need a change today, lift your hands right now. Amen. And shout out to Jesus. I need my circumstances to change. I need you to turn my captivity. It is said by people that in the psychiatric field, that human beings cannot entertain two thoughts about different things simultaneously. That's why we cannot doubt and believe at the same time. We alternate back and forth. But didn't James say a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways? And let not that man 
think that he shall receive anything of the Lord? Somebody needs a change today. Somebody needs a reset. Somebody needs a check up from the neck up. Somebody needs a deliverance. I didn't think Holy Ghost filled people needed deliverance. Yes, they do. When they become oppressed, repressed, suppressed. When their thought world is invaded by negativity and doubt. When we can't believe God for, for, for practically anything. And all we expect is an onslaught of difficulty and problems. We need a deliverance. Come on. If we want a healthy revival, we're going to have to be a healthy congregation. And we cannot be dysfunctional and healthy at the same time. The Bible says they were all in one mind and in one accord. What kind of mind do you think they had that day when the Holy Ghost was poured out? I'll tell you what, it was a mindset of anticipation. It was a mindset of this is it. It was a mindset of it's just the beginning. It's the mindset of God's going to take on the forces of evil that have arrayed themselves against us. Come on, somebody. It's time for a change. It's time for a turn. It's time for a deliverance. It's time for a breakthrough. And so memories help us maintain our sense of continuity in life, but they can also hold us captive. so easy to forget all the blessings and to remember all the challenges and disappointments it's so easy to look back over our past and it looks kind of like the wagon trail where all the pioneers wagon wheels fell off and discarded broken wagons on ox heads and bones and grave marks everywhere yeah there's a lot of things that we thank god are behind us but if your past tries to reach up and grab you by the nap of the neck and hold you back, you need God to turn your captivity. Your past doesn't have the authority to hinder your future. There is a cleansing stream of blood. It flows from Emmanuel's veins. And the blood of Jesus Christ is able to cleanse us from all sin and failure and error. Amen. Paul said, therefore, forgetting the things which are behind me, I reach forth to those things which are before. And I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Memories from the past, worries about the future, leave us captives of today. I want to say this in the Holy Ghost. Somebody's allowing your future to bum you out. Someone has, you have become the prophet of your own tomorrow. And you have prophesied to yourself that it's not going to get better, it's going to get worse. Well, I want to tell you in the Holy Ghost, God wants to turn your captivity. Did you know that before you leave here, you can actually believe, uh, amen, that there's still a future for you? I want you to lift your hands right now. I want you to praise. Praise God for your future right now in the name of Jesus. I will not suspend my tomorrows. I will not permit my yesterdays to control my tomorrows. I am not a prisoner of the present. The future is going to speak to me in tones of victory and not defeat in the name of Jesus. And the past is silenced in Jesus' name. And so, when we become traumatized by life situations, and there is a division within ourselves, please understand the trauma that would have attended Job's difficulties. In rapid succession, he went from a man of prosperity and overt blessings of God to a desperate, broken, sick poor man with no children and a disillusioned wife that's on the point of a mental breakdown boils all over his body and absolutely no explanation for what was going on if you don't think that could cause a fragmentation of oneself then you haven't experienced any bad things in your life 
because most of us couldn't cope with even one of the events that visited Job, let alone the rapid succession of four or five that were catastrophic in nature. And what happens when we become the victim of a trauma of some type? Well, oftentimes we dissociate from the trauma and we find a way not to live, just to survive. We develop a robotic, disconnected, disenfranchised mindset. We insulate ourselves from anyone who could hurt us or anyone who could help us for that matter. We lose trust. We lose trust in our loved ones. We lose trust in our friends. And we learn only to try to get through the next day. One researcher said trauma changes the insula, the self-awareness systems. Traumatized people often become insensible to themselves. I'm glad to report I don't hear about it often, but once in a while, somebody says, I'm just numb. I'm numb. I'm numb when I think of God. I'm numb when I think of family. I'm numb when I think of the future. I'm numb when I think of the past. What does that mean? That means somebody has become a prisoner in their mind and in their emotions and they need a chain breaker and if there's somebody that you feel numb you can't cry anymore you can't laugh anymore you don't care if people are with you or not with you you're just like a zombie I'm here to tell you God wants to turn your captivity that there is a power available in the name of Jesus that can change all of that and you can feel again and you can smile again and yes you can cry again Studies about PTSD, rape victims, soldiers from the battlefield, victims of uh, survivors of, of, of auto accidents, or of emotional, physical abuse, or sexual abuse. These are all stressors. Not everybody that goes through these things um, ends up in the same condition. They are contributors to the possibility of PTSD. But usually they're kind of like the straw that breaks the camel's back. There has to be, um, there has to be a history of, of trauma that has eroded the foundation of the mind and of the spirit. The earliest writings of damaged spirits and minds comes from Homer's Iliad. Warriors returning from the Trojan battles would come home but only part of them would return. The other part was lost somewhere on the battlefield. They didn't have terms to describe it back then. Stephen Crane's Red Badge of Courage, many of us saw that when we were in you know, grade school. There was a condition that described the survivors of the Civil War and they called it the soldier's heart. Basically the same description of those that suffer PTSD. All this is indicative of something that I want you to see. It's a cycle of distress. When the war ends, another one begins. When the dying stops, when the whirlwind stops, when the wife stops asking me to curse God, when my friends stop telling me it's my fault, when there's silence, then there's another battle that goes on. And he said, oh, that I knew where I might find him. He became disassociated from himself, from those around him, from his God. Although he maintained his his practical integrity. In other words, he didn't give up on God, but he felt like it seemed like God gave up on him. How do we know that? He said, if he slay me, who talks like that? Who reaches the point where it looks like God may have become my adversary? Who would believe? Amen. Would you believe that about the God that you serve today? You would if you got in the condition that he was in. Maybe God's trying to kill me. But if that's the case, God, amen, I'm still going to stick with you even if you don't like me. Praise God. God. Hey, I 
made a pledge like that one time when the devil hounded, hounded, hounded. You're a failure. You won't amount to nothing. You'll never do anything great for God. Nobody will listen to you. You won't make any kind of a difference in the world. You might as well give up the preaching idea. You know what I told the devil? I said, God, I'm going to tell you this. I'm with you. Amen. For keeps. If for no other reason, I'm going to preach to make the devil mad. Okay. Let's make that deal. If we don't have revival, if I can't manage to do anything, if we never build a church, I'm going to make the devil mad because I'm going to open my mouth and proclaim the goodness of God in the land of the living. That was about the last time the devil ever lied like that. Uh, Because once he realizes you've plugged in, uh, amen, and there's been a change uh, in you, then he walks off and finds somebody else to mess with. Praise God. My, 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 I feel the Holy Ghost in this place. I want a liberator. Uh, There's a liberator to come through here. And so Job's crisis led him on a journey. Gone were the familiar sights and sounds of communal worship at the local synagogue or gathering place. Gone was the laughter of the wife of his youth. Gone were the doting children. Gone were the calls from society around him to judge on matters of controversy because of his great wisdom. Job became in an instant a stranger. A stranger to his friends. A stranger to his wife. A stranger to his God and a stranger to himself. He was bound. He was bound even though he was still faithful. He was in prison even though he still honored the existence of God. He felt alone and isolated. Job's bondage. How? How does a guy like Job, he's the best guy. He, we, we start out the book of Job, God commending Job in a way he never commends any other human being. Hey, Satan, have you considered my servant Job? How there's no one in the world like him. And then by the 42nd chapter of the book of Job, he says to God in prayer, I abhor myself in dust and in ashes. You know what Job's, what was the source of Job's bondage? It was, he was trying to fit God into his fragmented, messed up world instead of fitting himself into God's perfect plan. So many people make the mistake of excusing themselves from God's plan and try to stuff God into their disheveled world. And they wonder why the lack of progress. Someone wrote this, and I don't have the the source, but he said, when I was a kid, I used to pray every night for a new bicycle. Then I realized that the Lord doesn't work that way. So I stole one and asked him to forgive me. That's what I call trying to cram a good God into a messed up world. Hallelujah. Can I take a couple minutes and finish? Identity politics is all the rage now. Things that today are celebrated by society in the 1960s were considered by psychiatric uh, journals to be um, disorders, psychological disorders. Now, they are badges of uh, honor. When I was a kid, physiology determined, determined the gender for who you were. In the 1990s, you begin to hear talk about females being born in male bodies, males being born in female bodies. But 2015 or so, you can literally redetermine your gender by an act of belief. It hopscotches over everything and says, if you believe that you're a girl in a man's body, then you're now a girl. Well, 
Well, okay. What does that, what does that mean? Well, fast forward to Caitlyn Jenner. Now we have an example of a male former athlete, gold medal winner. Now he's a female. She's a female. And now says, God told me to do this. It's when you start bringing God in and then you make him responsible for the mess. Didn't Hernandez just hang himself in jail? Wasn't he a football prodigy? Didn't he have the world in front of him? Wasn't he, didn't he have the possibility to make tens of millions of dollars in his life? He was only 27 years old. But he hung himself, wrote a note, uh, presumably to a male associate, and opened the Bible to John 3.16. Now look, if God wants to save people, I'm not in the throwing them out of heaven business, okay? But I'm here to say, the God that I know wants me to get into his world and not cram him into my mess. <laughs> The, the God that I know says, I'll help you and strengthen you, but you're going to have to come my way, praise God. And if you'll take a step my way, maybe I'll take a step your way. But if you think that you can wreck your life, and then I've got to just accept the wreckage and, and condone the wreckage, then I'm sorry. I know it's, it's not the kind of stuff you maybe want to shout over, but the principle, I want to get to the, that doesn't apply to us, okay? I'm basically not preaching to anybody in this room when I say that. But what I, what I am saying is that there's other ways that people have been shortchanged, and I want the musicians to come. One of them is this idea that we accept the Lord into our hearts, okay? Now. I want you to hear me real clear. There's nothing wrong with accepting the Lord into your heart as long as you don't stop there. But it's when people are stole, told that that's the stopping place that I have problems. Because it's more than us accepting Jesus. Here again, it's the same idea, trying to cram God into my un, uh, uh, unregenerate circumstance. We need to remember it is God who needs to accept us. Amen. Amen. And if we reach out to God, it is the next thing that we want God to reach out to us. And the Bible says we have been translated into the kingdom of his dear son by this miraculous work of the spirit of God. What does the Bible say? How do you get to God? Here's what it says. You believe, you repent. You get water baptized in Jesus' name, and you become born again through the power of the Holy Ghost. Uh, praise God. It's not just inviting God into my world, uh, but it's God raising us up into heavenly places and bringing us into his world. <laughs> See, the prodigal son, for all practical intents and purposes, orphaned himself from his father's relationship. He assumed that he could never be uh, restored, and he was willing to accept living in the barn and working as a hired hand in his father's house. Matter of fact, he came with the prayer on his lips, Father, I have sinned, and I am no longer worthy to be called your son. I expect you to banish me to the outer perimeter to treat me like a nobody because of the things that I've done. But you see, God doesn't work that way. Praise God. If you, imagine what would have happened if God would have agreed to work with him in his world. That in the barn he would have lived, in the barn he would have slept, in the fields he would have worked, and he would have never heard the word son. But God doesn't operate that way. When you step up to the threshold of God's world, God runs out to meet you and the next thing he escorts you into his world where the music is playing where the lamb is being sacrificed where the party is being conducted hallelujah because he doesn't want he doesn't want to live you to live outside of your privileges 
So Job's experience was even though he prayed, even though he worshiped, even though he believed, he was a prisoner. Job 42 and 6 says, Then Job answered the Lord and said, I know that thou canst do everything, that no thought can be withholden from thee. Who is he that hideth counsel without knowledge? Therefore have I uttered that I, ins I have uttered that I understood not things too wonderful for me, which I knew not. Here I beseech thee, and I will speak. I will demand of thee, and declare thou unto me. I have heard of thee by the hearing of the ear, but now my eye seeth thee. Wherefore, I abhor myself, and repent in dust and ashes. And when jo Job repented, his three friends brought their sacrifice to Job and they sacrificed and repented. And Job didn't, God didn't turn Job's captivity till his repentance became contagious to those around him that needed repentance. And when Eliphaz and Shofar and Bildad brought their sacrifices and they sacrificed and repented, then the Bible says, when Job prayed for his friends, God turned his captivity. In other words, when Job said, not my will, but thine be done. God, you don't have to come into my mess. Just escort me into your paradise. Just take me where you want me. Just guide me where I need to be. I've spoke of things I didn't know anything of, God, but now my eyes see and I recognize. Rather than cram you into my circumstances, so many people want to know, why would God let this happen to me? It's the wrong question to ask. Amen. The right question to ask is now we're that we're here. What is it that you will have me to do? Praise God. Not why did you let this happen to me? Uh, here's your servant. Speak because I'm listening. Now that we're here, what is it that you want me to do? That's why Paul could say these chains have fallen out to the furtherance of the gospel. It took God to lock me in prison to realize he wants me to write. And so here I can do nothing but write. And therefore my chains are my freedom. It's not God, why am I in jail? It's God now that I'm here. What do you want me to do for you? I want us to stand. And so I want to speak to the prison that you are in. Someone's in the prison of why me, Lord? God can deliver you from that. And when he delivers you, you won't need explanations because you'll have instructions. Ananias could have easily thought that God was sentencing him to his own death when he said, I want you to, I want you, when, when Saul of Tarsus comes knocking on your door, I want you to open the door to it. But, but, but God, but God, but God, he's a killer. <laughs> he could have bolted the doors and turned the lights out, draw the window shades and acted like he wasn't home and he would have missed the will of God. Oh. Now that I'm here, I feel this so strong. Somebody feels like there's wreckage all around and like your world has been blown and shattered to a thousand pieces. And you're thinking, where is God? And God's saying, where are you? I'm here to tell you something. If you'll come down to this altar and pray a simple prayer, God, now that I'm here, what is it that I can do for you? I believe God will turn your captivity right here and right now. These altars are open. Now that I'm here, what is it that you want me to do? Now that I'm here, how can I serve? If I keep trying to pray around it, if I keep trying to stuff God into it, if I keep trying to explain the unexplainable, if I keep questioning things that there may be no answers for, 
I may be I may live a stranger I may be an imprisoned Christian for the rest of my life but if I will just say God I want to get into your plan now I tried to get you into mine it's somewhere you don't want to go so here Lord I want to get into your plan in the name of Jesus in the name of Jesus right now God take this now that I've experienced a, a shipwreck what can I do for you now that my world has crumbled at my feet how can I be of service now that I've lived a setback now that my greatest fears have come to pass now that I'm sick in my body what can I do Lord in the name of Jesus I feel the presence of God there's a liberator there's a mighty deliverer in this house in the name of Jesus turn our captivity